In this, the fourth lesson of the Henry George School of Social Sciences course, Understanding Our Political Economy, we will now examine the history of money creation, the introduction of money substitutes, such as paper currency and coinage of nominal intrinsic value, and the introduction of credit as the driver of modern economies of exchange. The arguments over what constitutes a just system of money, credit, and banking have been ongoing for, well, several thousand years. We will now examine some of this history of how money came into use and how its use and abuse contributed to the growth and collapse of societies throughout the ancient and modern eras. Henry George offers this definition of money as he sees its role in political economy. He writes, money is a general medium of exchange, the common flow through which wealth is transformed from one form to another. Throughout history, everything from cattle, beads, salt, barley, whiskey, and tobacco served as a medium of exchange. Commodity money circulated based on wide acceptance, scarcity, and or a high amount of labor required to produce the commodity. The touchstone made it possible to test soft metals for purity, allowing one to quickly determine the content of a particular metal in a coin or raw metal. From this point on, gold and silver, although relatively scarce, spread around the entire globe as standard forms of money. An important and positive characteristic was the fact that they are virtually indestructible. On the negative side, the coinage was heavy and impractical to use for the purchase of large amounts of goods. Also, if lost or stolen, the consequences could bring financial ruin. Early coins were subject to counterfeiting, that is, debasement. Stamping of coins with images made counterfeiting more difficult. Coins could still be shaved to produce a small amount of raw metal, eventually producing enough new metal to mint a new counterfeit coin. So additional innovations were needed. In response, issuers of money added one new important feature to coins. Coins with ridged edge could no longer be shaved, thus preventing the debasement of the coinage. It is worth noting that this innovation prevented kings and princes from shaving the coins taken in as rents from those working the land and as taxes. A powerful state, such as the Roman Empire, could mandate use of copper or even wood coins. Roman power assured its coinage was accepted as legal tender, and the coinage was needed to pay ground rents for leased land, dwellings, and most goods, as well as for taxes and tribute. From the fall of the Western Roman Empire, a gradual expansion of feudal manners led to a decline in money circulation. The lords of the feudal manors took a share of crops from peasants in lieu of money rents and taxes. Peasants engaged in barter, but had little in surplus to trade. Then came the Crusades. In 1204, the Fourth Crusade began. The Christian armies of Europe sacked Constantinople and returned home with huge quantities of precious stones, gold and silver, worth nearly one million silver marks. And when the European princes and knights returned home, the gold and silver they brought with them set the stage for replacement of feudal crop sharing arrangements with cash and credit driven markets. Peasants were now required to sell their crops for cash, from which they paid ground rents and taxes to the land baron. Feudal obligations broke down and the peasants assumed the risks of a failed crop or insufficient prices for what they sold. The end of the Crusades left many European princes holding new estates in the eastern Mediterranean. Trade was renewed and the flow of money created a need for merchant bankers. Blessed by their locations, Venice and Genoa became major centers of Mediterranean commerce. Florence emerged as a center of banking. The Bardi and Peruzzi families were dominant in Florence in the 14th century and established branches in other parts of Europe to facilitate their trading activities. 
Both of these banking families extended substantial loans to Edward III of England to finance the 100 years war against France. But Edward defaulted and the banks failed. About 1429, Jacques Cuer formed a commercial partnership with two brothers named Goddard. In 1432, he was in Damascus purchasing goods for shipment back to France. Four years later, he was appointed master of the Paris Mint and to other high offices. By 1450, he was, by many estimates, the wealthiest Frenchman. He was then accused of poisoning an aristocratic woman and arrested, his property confiscated by the king. He later escaped and made his way to Rome. In southern Germany, the Fugger family financed the House of Habsburg. They made their first loan to a Habsburg Archduke in 1487, taking as security an interest in silver and copper mines. In 1491 and again in 1505, loans were made to Maximilian, secured by the feudal rights to two Austrian counties. In 1519, the Fugger bankers financed the campaign of Maximilian's grandson, Charles, to be elected emperor. However, by the end of the 16th century, the family withdrew from financial risk-taking after some disastrous ventures and settled into an aristocratic existence. A Medici family emerged as banker to the Catholic Church in the early 15th century, collecting tithes from church members. The Medici refrained from making loans to princes and kings, known to be very poor risks, and so remained profitable until its London operation made loans to Edward IV, whose treasury was emptied by the War of the Roses. The stage was now set for the development of the first modern banking institutions. The Bank of Amsterdam was founded as a deposit bank protected by the city of Amsterdam. The bank took in both foreign and local coinage, which was reminted as well as gold and silver bullion. After taking a small minting and management fee, depositors were credited for the balance. From the great Scottish moral philosopher and political economist Adam Smith, we learn of the chaotic conditions existing before the Bank of Amsterdam was established. Smith wrote, Before 1609, the great quantity of clipped and worn foreign coin, which the extensive trade of Amsterdam brought from all parts of Europe, reduced the value of its currency about 9% below that of good money fresh from the mint. Such money no sooner appeared than it was melted down or carried away, as it always is in such circumstances. The merchants, with plenty of currency, could not always find a sufficient quantity of good money to pay their bills of exchange, and the value of those bills, in spite of several regulations which were made to prevent it, became in a great measure uncertain. And then, once the Bank of Amsterdam began doing business, the system of exchange improved dramatically. Adam Smith continues. In order to remedy these inconveniences, a bank was established in 1609 under the guarantee of the city. The bank received both foreign coin and the light and worn coin of the country at its intrinsic value in the good standard money of the country, deducting only so much as was necessary for defraying the expense of coinage and the other necessary expense of management. For the value which remained, after this small deduction was made, it gave credit in its books. This credit was called bank money, which, as it represented money exactly according to the standard of the mint, was always of the same real value and intrinsically worth more than current money. Unfortunately, problems developed during the 1630s when officers of the bank engaged in speculations in the tulip market. In 1637, the tulip bubble burst, and with the burst, the bank's assets were seriously eroded. The bank was also making loans to the city of Amsterdam and to the Dutch East India Company, far above its own assets. 
thereby leaving the bank with only fractional reserves. Even so, the bank's central role as intermediary in the global economy enabled it to survive until dissolved in 1796. The Bank of Amsterdam's importance was eventually eclipsed by the Bank of England, which financed Britain's bid for a global colonial empire. The bank was chartered in 1694 with coinage, also referred to as specie or hard money, raised from investors. This money was then loaned to the British government. Now, rather than actual money in its vaults, the bank held government securities as its primary asset. Against this category of asset, backed not by specific collateral, but by the taxing power of the government, the bank was permitted to issue banknotes equal to its original money, that is, what was confusingly referred to as financial capital, with redemption guaranteed by the government. The era of fractional reserve banking, as the common practice, had arrived. The bank was chartered by the Congress in response to concerns raised by Robert Morris, Superintendent of Finance. The bank's functions and structure were designed by Alexander Hamilton, and the bank was capitalized with loans from the Netherlands and France. In 1785, after the War for Independence was over, the bank's charter was repealed. Each state recognized that a national bank threatened state sovereignty over its financial affairs and voted to adopt a decentralized financial system that kept the national government dependent on the states and therefore relatively weak. However, with the adoption of the new federal constitution, the first bank of the United States was chartered in 1791 for 20 years. This charter was renewed in 1816 for the Second Bank of the United States. Power shifted back to the states with the election of Andrew Jackson as President of the United States. Jackson opposed the bank and ordered all federal deposits removed in 1833. The bank lost its federal charter in 1836 and seized operations in 1841. The years to follow were dominated by a decentralized system of state chartered banks. However, the situation remained fluid and chaotic. People were migrating to the vast North American interior. Currency and credit were desperately needed to meet the needs of the growing economy. Actual money was almost non-existent at the frontier, which could only be remedied by the establishment of local banks authorized to issue currency as money substitutes. After 1816, regulation of banks was left to the states. New banks were subscribed with some specie, but control over issuance of banknotes was often ineffective. Currency issued by the 700 plus state banks was discounted anywhere from 0 to 100 percent based on public confidence in and knowledge of the bank. Historians disagree on the effects of this period of minimally regulated banking. However, some years ago, Alan Greenspan, serving as chairman of the Board of Governors of the U.S. Federal Reserve System, stated in a speech that, More recently, some scholars have suggested that the problems of the free banking period were exaggerated. Retrospective analyses have shown, for example, that losses to banknote holders and bank failures were not out of line with other comparable periods in U.S. banking history. As the United States approached mid-century, the momentum for reform and monetary stability increased. By the onset of the Civil War, state banks numbered 1,562. The National Banking Acts of 1863 and 1864 attempted to assert some degree of federal control over the banking system without the formation of another central bank by creating a system of national banks a uniform national currency, and an active secondary market for treasury securities to help finance the Union's war expenses. The outcome was that by 1870, there were 1,638 national banks chartered and the number of state banks had fallen to 325. 
Surviving state banks responded by offering customers checking accounts as a substitute for bank notes. As a result, by 1890, only 10% of the nation's money supply was in the form of circulating coinage or paper currency. Combined with lower hard money capital and reserve requirements, as well as the ease with which states issued banking charters, state banks again became the dominant banking structure in the late 1880s. The U.S. banking system limped along until the Wall Street Panic of 1907. Speculative bubbles in the real estate and stock markets burst. Several long-standing New York banks failed. The unemployment rate reached 20% in the fall of 1907. Millions lost their deposits as thousands of banks collapsed across the nation. The panic ended only after J.P. Morgan intervened. Morgan personally made temporary loans to key New York banks and other financial institutions. In 1908, Senator Nelson Aldrich established and chaired a commission to investigate the crisis and propose future solutions. Woodrow Wilson won the Democratic Party's nomination for the office of President of the United States in 1912, defeating Theodore Roosevelt, who ran as a progressive. In his acceptance speech, Wilson warned against what he termed the money trust, expressing his concern that a concentration of the control of credit may at any time become infinitely dangerous to free enterprise. After taking office, Wilson signed legislation to reform the nation's currency system. The Federal Reserve System was the result. Despite Woodrow Wilson's stated desires, the bankers ensured the new Federal Reserve System was made private and not a government agency. The Federal Reserve Act established a system of 8 to 12 mostly autonomous regional reserve banks that would be owned by commercial banks and whose actions would be coordinated by a committee appointed by the President. From inception, the Federal Reserve System has had its harsh critics, including at the time Congressman Charles Lindbergh, who argued, the act establishes the most gigantic trust on earth. When the president signs this bill, the invisible government of the monetary power will be legalized. The greatest crime of the ages is perpetuated by this banking and currency bill. Beyond the debate over whether the states or the national government should control the monetary and banking functions, there is the debate over whether currency ought to be backed by one or more precious metals, gold, silver, or both, a system referred to as bimetallism. This had been a major political issue during the 19th century. Trade with China during the 18th and 19th centuries drained Europe and the U.S. of large quantities of silver. As a result, gold gradually replaced silver as the mandated backing for most currencies. Legislation passed in 1873 in the United States embraced the gold standard and demonetized silver. Mining interests and Westerners in the United States fought against this measure because gold was so scarce in much of the country. And the Westerners found a champion in William Jennings Bryant. Bryant called for bimetallism. Campaigning for the presidency in 1896, Bryant delivered his famous No Cross of Gold speech, in which he declared, If protection has slain its thousands, the gold standard has slain its tens of thousands. A major part of the debate in nearly every country is whether the issuance of currency should be fully privatized or made the direct responsibility of government. Moreover, does the currency need to be redeemable in something specific, such as coinage minted with a standard amount of gold or silver? One view held by economists such as Fred Foldvari is that free banking would work very efficiently and with little corruption, he explains. 
The artificial increase in money supply can be halted permanently by implementing free banking. Without a central bank and a national currency imposed on the economy, inflation of the money supply beyond the growth of the economy is no longer feasible since there is no longer a monopoly of the money supply. One way for government to try to stabilize its economy is to erect direct control over the monetary system. In 1933, the United States government took the dramatic step of closing down the gold market and ending its commitment to redeem gold certificates. Which leads us into a discussion of the causes of economic recessions and depressions. Monetary reformers have focused on the roles played by money, banking, and credit. However, as we will soon discuss, political economists such as Henry George concluded the cause were fundamentally systemic. Management of the money supply and regulation of the banking sector, important as these functions are, have never prevented the operation of economic cycles of boom and bust. Other, more powerful forces create stress and lead to periodic crashes. We've reached the end of Lesson 4.